Since the very first and last scenes of season one of Game of Thrones, we've been promised an epic conflict between the living and the dead that would see magical ice demons fight against fire-breathing magical dragons. Now, whether you loved, liked, hated, or were disappointed by season seven, you cannot deny how epic it was to finally see these two opposing powers come face to face. All in all, Season 7 really was a precursor to the Great War between the armies of the living and the dead. We've been promised the war for so long, everybody's saying winter is coming, the Great War is finally here, but it's not really here. The season's main focus was the relationship between Jon and Daenerys and how these two opposing personalities who have been on opposite sides of the world for most of the show came together and joined their power to eventually fight the Night King in Season 8. And they also got busy. It's really easy to spot the parallels between Jon and Daenerys. When the show started, a lot of people thought the two main characters would be Rob and Daenerys, but that's the genius of the show, that they've had these red herrings, they've misled us, and now this bastard boy and foreign girl are coming together to save the world. Both of their mothers died in childbirth, they've spent most of their lives as outsiders, and have made their names by protecting those who cannot protect themselves. They're very similar characters. They are revolutionaries, and they are also the last two surviving Targaryens. But another thing they have in common is the prophecy of the prince that was promised. What does your lord expect from me? Bosses bantis amazis, merikivio dolalaris os machagon kuntas. The prince who was promised will bring the dawn. I'm afraid I'm not a prince. Now before we start this deep dive into Game of Thrones history and lore, I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is a website that allows you to design your own website. So whether if you're a small business owner, a musician, a writer, they have a wide variety of different templates for designing your own personal website. And if you use the link squarespace.com nerdsoup, you'll receive 10% off your first purchase. You can find the link in the description below. Okay, let's get started. The Prophecy of the Prince That Was Promised Now this prophecy has dominated the show. There have been dozens, hundreds of theories based on who is this legendary figure. There are several different interpretations of the prophecy of the prince that was promised. The original prophecy was made 5,000 years ago by a red priest, and it talks of a legendary figure named Azor Ahai. Thousands of years before the prophecy was made, Azor Ahai fought against the Great Other during a period of darkness. The prophecy states that Azor Ahai will be reborn and will fight against the Great Other once again during the Long Night. The terms Azor Ahai and Prince That Was Promised are used interchangeably by the Red Priestess Melisandre, but she tends to use Azor Ahai more frequently, probably because she's a follower of the Faith of Rolar. In regards to Westerosi mythology, there's also the story of the Last Hero who was a legendary figure that led the living against the dead during the first Long Night in Westeros. We first learn about this figure from Old Nan in the first A Song of Ice and Fire novel, A Game of Thrones. A shorter version of this scene was recreated on the television show with Old Nan and Bran, the stories of the last hero and Azor Ahai are very similar. Azor Ahai is a legendary figure in the faith of Rolar, and the last hero is a legendary figure in the northern mythology of Westeros. Both fought off the Great Other during an elongated period of darkness, but it is still unknown if these two legendary figures are the same person. With concerns to who may be the prince that was promised, strong cases can be made for both Jon and Daenerys. Both characters nearly fit every known prerequisite of the prophecy, and more importantly, they are both Targaryens. The prince that was promised was prophesized to be born from the Targaryen line, and the prophecy itself has dominated House Targaryen's destiny for decades. Like most prophecies in Game of Thrones, the prince that was promised prophecy is still unclear, there is no textual evidence of the prophecy itself, only fragments that do not paint the full picture, and the only person who may have known the prophecy in its entirety has been dead for 17 years. In my dreams, I kill him every night. It's done, Your Grace. The Targaryens are gone. Not all of them. Rhaegar Targaryen has only physically appeared in Game of Thrones once, but his legacy looms large over the show. His name is often recalled, either bitterly or praisingly, by 
those who knew him, and the events that led to his premature death are often debated and disputed. Rhaegar's current reputation in Westeros was crafted by a series of lies. Most people believed him to be a murderer and a rapist, the man who kidnapped Lyanna Stark, which effectively started Robert's Rebellion and led to the downfall of the 300-year-old Targaryen dynasty. How many tens of thousands had to die because Rhaegar chose your aunt? Yes, he chose her. And then he kidnapped her and raped her. In truth, Rhaegar was in love with Lyanna. The couple married in a secret ceremony in Dorne. And while it may be true that Rhaegar did in fact love his lady Lyanna, their marriage may have been more about prophecy than true love. The firstborn son of King Aerys Targaryen and Queen Rhaella Targaryen, Rhaegar didn't have many friends as a child and spent most of his time reading. Those closest to him say he was bookish to a fault, and people would joke that his mother must have swallowed a book and a candle while he was in the womb. As he grew older, he became an exceptional warrior and eventually made loyal companionships with John Connington and Arthur Dane. But even in his adulthood, he remained bookish. His true obsession wasn't sword or knowledge, but prophecy, specifically the prophecy of the prince that was promised. The Targaryen obsession with prophecy began with King Aerys I. King Aerys was also a bookish man who spent most of his time reading old scrolls and texts. It was said about the king that he would sooner bring a book to bed rather than his wife. Similar to Rhaegar, he was highly interested in prophecy and once read a text that prophesied the return of dragons to the world. By the time King Aerys came into power, all the Targaryen dragons were already dead. This obsession with prophecies continued through the reign of King Aegon V, better known as Egg to some fans. Readers of the George R. R. Martin novel A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms are familiar with King Aegon from his adventures as a child. As a boy of nine, the young prince squired for Sir Duncan the Tall, and the two formed an unlikely friendship. The dynamic duo traveled throughout all the Seven Kingdoms and became ingratiated with the common folk of Westeros, and also assisted in the suppression of the Second Blackfyre Rebellion. When Aegon's father, King Maegar, was killed during the Peak Uprising, Prince Aegon was crowned the new King of Westeros. He soon named Sir Duncan the Tall the Lord Commander of his Kingsguard, and the King's first son was even named after his old friend Sir Duncan. His son, nicknamed Prince Duncan the Small and the Prince of the Dragonflies, was also known, like his father, to spend most of his time with the common folk of Westeros. Against his father's wishes, he even married a lowborn girl named Jenny, who was referred to as Jenny of Old Stones. Because of Jenny's lowborn status, Prince Duncan was forced to give up his rights to the Iron Throne. After marrying Prince Duncan, Jenny arrived to King's Landing with one of her closest friends, an unnamed woods witch from the Riverlands who claimed to be a descendant of the Children of the Forest. Described as deformed, albino, and a stunted thing, the woods witch was known to have prophetic dreams, and she prophesied that the prince that was promised would be born from the line of Prince Ares, better known as the Mad King, and his younger sister, Prince Rhaella. Initially against relationships of incest, King Aegon forced his two children to marry after learning of the the witch's prophecy. Prince Aerys and Prince Rhaella weren't exactly fond of each other, but they reluctantly married and lived unhappily married for the rest of their lives. Not only did King Aegon force his children to marry because of the woods witch's prophecy, but similar to King Aerys I, Aegon believed that dragons could return to the world. During his reign, King Aegon was known as a righteous man, and because of his upbringing and adventures with Sir Duncan the Tall, he made sweeping reforms to the rules and laws of Westeros to benefit the small folk. With many of his reforms aimed at helping the common people of Westeros, many great lords were against his proposals, and unlike previous Targaryen monarchs, Aegon did not have dragons, and thus was forced to make several concessions to these great lords. The righteous king believed that only dragons would make these great lords listen, so King Aegon devised a plan, basically a magical ritual with the hope of hatching seven dragon eggs. The final years of his reign were dominated by the search of ancient in lore and texts about dragon breeding in Old Valeria. He commissioned journeys all across the world as far east as Ashai in search of finding these texts and hidden knowledge about the subject. The actual ritual to hatch the seven dragon eggs took place at Summerhall, a pleasure castle of House Targaryen in the Dornish marches. King Aegon summoned many of his family and friends to attend the ritual in celebration of the birth of his grandson to Prince Aerys and Princess Rhaella. Unfortunately, the magical ritual to hatch the seven dragon eggs went 
went terribly wrong. There are little to no records about the tragedy of Summerhall, but a page from Archmaester Gildan's History of House Targaryen provides hints of the tragedy. King Aegon lost his life during the fires, along with Sir Duncan the Tall, his son Prince Duncan the Small, Jenny from Oldstones, and her friend, the Woods Witch. This fateful day would go on to be remembered as the Tragedy at Summerhall. The Tragedy at Summerhall also coincided with the birth of Rhaegar Targaryen, and the Tragedy would haunt Rhaegar for the rest of his life. Despite being just a day old when the Tragedy occurred, as he grew older, Rhaegar became increasingly obsessed with the Tragedy at Summerhall. In a storm of swords, Daenerys tells Barristan Selmy that her brother Viserys only spoke of Rhaegar's birth once. She wonders if it was the shadow of Summerhall that haunted Rhaegar, and Barristan Selmy replies, yes. What's interesting is that Selmy also tells Daenerys that Summerhall was the place that Rhaegar loved best and he would often visit with only his harp for company. Rhaegar would return from Summerhall singing solemn songs of tragedy and despair, and Selmy said that it felt like he was singing of his family's tragedies, both past, present, and future. The fact that Rhaegar visited Summerhall so frequently is certainly strange. It was said of Rhaegar that he was a cold and stoic man and, and always had an aura of dread surrounding him, but still, for your favorite place to be the ruins of a family tragedy that nearly wiped out your entire line, I mean, you have to be a really depressing guy. I mean, go to the beach, Rhaegar. Go make some friends. When we start examining the circumstances surrounding his visits to Summerhall, it starts to make more sense. His obsession with the ruined castle could be connected to his obsession with prophecy. I mean, look at the two prophecies that have dominated House Targaryen, the return of dragons and the prophecy of the prince that was promised. The tragedy of Summerhall is where those prophecies went to die. King Aegon believed that he could bring dragons back into the world, died at Summerhall. The Woods Witch, who prophesied that the prince that was promised would be born from the line of King Aerys and Queen Rhaella, also died at Summerhall. Now, the prophecy of the prince that was promised was very important to Rhaegar. For many years, he thought himself to be that legendary figure, and then he believed it would be his son, Aegon. Now, his change of heart is unexplained. We're not sure why he went from believing it to be himself to his son. It's said that one day he read something and decided that he must now become a warrior, but that still doesn't explain his change of heart. The one possibility is that he came across some sort of information, whether it be through text or scroll scrolls that explain the prophecy in its entirety. Now, this is where the ghost of Highheart comes in. During the tragedy of Summerhall, most people in Westeros believed that the Woods Witch, who came to court with Jenny of Oldstones, died in the fires. But some fans believe that there is textual evidence that suggests that the Woods Witch survived the tragedy and went on to live as the Ghost of Highheart. The Ghost of Highheart is a character that doesn't appear in the show, but has made several appearances in the third Song of Ice and Fire novel, A Storm of Swords. She is known as a short, albino woman who lives in the Riverlands, and is known to have prophetic dreams. She is encountered by the Brotherhood Without Banners on two occasions. The Brotherhood traveled to meet with the Ghost of High Heart and heed her visions of both the future and the past. She informs them about the deaths of Renly Baratheon and Balon Greyjoy, and she also tells them about the death and resurrection of Catelyn Stark. These visions of future and past come at a price, not in coin or service, but music. The Ghost of High Heart demands that they play her a song, Jenny's song. Now, Jenny's song is nameless to the reader. It's not actually called Jenny's song, but the name has not been revealed by the author. There is only one known line of the song, and when sung, the ghost of High Heart will begin to sing along quietly while she sobs for her Jenny. Now, the obvious connection to the Woods Witch is Jenny's song is about Jenny of Oldstones, the woman who actually brought the Woods Witch to King's Landing. But the only known lyric of the song also suggests a connection. High in the halls of the kings who are gone, Jenny would dance with her ghosts. This lone lyric could be in reference to Jenny's marriage to Prince Duncan, her friendship with the Woods Witch, and the tragedy at Summerhall. Let's take a closer look at the lyric. High in the halls. This is obviously the Red Keep, where Jenny came to live with Prince Duncan after the two were married. Of the kings who are gone. In reference to all the previous Targaryen kings who ruled over Westeros and lived in the Red Keep. Jenny would dance with her ghosts. This is in reference to those that Jenny loved, her husband Prince Duncan, and more specifically her friend, the Woods Witch, 
who was now Jenny's ghost, or more specifically, the ghost of High Heart. She would dance with their ghosts, she would spend time with them, dance with them, enjoy their company, but now they're all dead, having died at the tragedy at Summerhall. Now, if the Woods Witch is in fact the ghost of High Heart, this would explain why she begins to cry every time she hears the song. If the song is in reference to the tragedy at Summerhall, and the Woods Witch was there, well, it's going to be a tragic memory for her, it makes sense. Our second piece of evidence that the Woods Witch is the ghost of High Heart is the ghost's encounter with Arya Stark. This is a scene that was recreated in the show between Arya and Melisandre in Season 3. When the ghost of High Heart first sees Arya, she becomes extremely frightened by her presence. Her response to Arya could be seen as foreshadowing Arya's training as a faceless assassin. Notice how the ghost of High Heart mentions that she gorged on grief at Summerhall. The connections between the Woods Witch and the Ghost of High Heart can't be coincidence. Their physical appearance is nearly identical. They are both known to be friends with a girl named Jenny. They were both present at Summerhall, and both the Ghost of High Heart and the Woods Witch are known to have prophetic dreams. And this could also explain why young Rhaegar Targaryen was constantly visiting Summerhall. There isn't any hard evidence to prove that the Woods Witch and Rhaegar met, but there are some subtle clues in the text. Let's go back to Daenerys' conversation with Barristan Selmy in A Storm of Swords. The two are discussing Rhaegar and Summerhall. Notice how Daenerys says it was the shadow of Summerhall that haunted him. The choice of words are not a coincidence. It was the shadow of Summerhall that haunted him. The Woods Witch survived the tragedy of Summerhall and stuck around the ruins for an extended period of time. She gorged on grief at Summerhall, and she could be viewed as a shadow or a ghost haunting the ruined castle. Daenerys also says that the shadow haunted Rhaegar, a subtle reference to the Woods Witch's new identity, the Ghost of High Heart. This still doesn't prove that the Woods Witch and Rhaegar ever crossed paths at Summerhall. It could be be just coincidental writing. The closest thing we have to a smoking gun is Jenny's song. We know from Barristan Selmy that Rhaegar would visit the ruins of Summerhall with only his harp for company, and would return with a sad song, singing of tragedy and kings who died. The one line we know from Jenny's song is clearly referencing the tragedies of House Targaryen, and we know it's a sad song because every time the ghost of High Heart hears it, she cries for her Jenny. Is it possible that Rhaegar is the writer of Jenny's song? Rhaegar Targaryen was known throughout the Seven Kingdoms as a highly skilled musician, especially with his harp. This much is known in the books and even in the show. What? I was thinking about all the times your brother made me go with him down from the Red Keep into the streets of King's Landing. Why? We like to walk among the people. We like to sing to them. He sang to them? Yes. <laughs> and I collected the money. Well, you'd like to see how much you could make. He was good? He was very good. Viserys never told you. He told me Rhaegar was good at killing people. Rhaegar never liked killing. Rhaegar's ability to make women cry when playing the harp is legendary. In fact, in his first encounter with Lyanna Stark at the tourney at Harrenhal, his playing brought her to tears during a celebratory feast. Jenny's song is known throughout the Seven Kingdoms as a very tragic and sad song, the type of song that Rhaegar sang when he would return from Summerhall. It usually brings women to tears, specifically the ghost of High Heart, and even men who have heard it find it to be sad and solemn. When you analyze the only known lyric to the song, you can find a clear connection to Jenny of Oldstones and the tragedy at Summerhall. Who else but the Woods Witch and Rhaegar would know of these events so well? Barristan Selmy says Rhaegar would sing songs of dead kings, or in this case, kings who are gone. And the song itself is usually accompanied by a wood harp, the same instrument that Rhaegar used to play. This could be the main reason why Rhaegar visited Summerhall so frequently. Similar to the Brotherhood Without Banners, Rhaegar would travel to Summerhall and meet with the Ghost of High Heart, and she would relay her visions of both the future and past, and Rhaegar would reward her with a song, in this case, Jenny's song. But what is the significance of Jenny's song? Once again, it goes back to prophecy. The Ghost of High Heart, or the Woods Witch, is the one who originally made the prophecy about the prince that was promised being born to the line of King Aerys and Queen Rhaella. This would leave Rhaegar, Viserys, Daenerys, and Rhaegar's three children, Aegon, Rhaenys, and Jon, as the only viable options. For many years, Rhaegar believed that he was the prince that was promised, probably because he was the only option. For 15 years, Rhaegar lived as an only child, with his parents unable to have children until Viserys and Daenerys were born. 
But then Rhaegar began to believe it was one of his children. There is only one mention as to why Rhaegar believed his son would be the prince that was promised. On the night Aegon was conceived, a red comet appeared in the sky, and Rhaegar believed that the prince must be born beneath a bleeding star. But still, his change of heart is a bit of a mystery. Maybe the ghost of High Heart expanded on her original prophecy and told Rhaegar the truth, that one of his children will be the prince that was promised, not him. Rhaegar's first two children were killed by the mountain during the sack of King's Landing during Robert's Rebellion, so that leaves Jon Snow as the only option. The Ghost of High Heart may have told Rhaegar that the prince that was promised must not only be born to the Targaryen line, but to the Stark line as well. This is why Rhaegar chose to annul his marriage with Elia and pursue Lyanna Stark, the woman whom he had fallen in love with during the tourney at Harrenhal. With this new knowledge about the prophecy, Rhaegar did two things. First, he pursued and successfully married Lyanna Stark and the couple had a child, Jon Snow. Secondly, with his newfound knowledge, Rhaegar hid the prophecy where anyone could find it, yet it could never be destroyed. He hid the prophecy in Jenny's song. The best evidence we have for Rhaegar hiding the prophecy in Jenny's song is one of Daenerys' visions in the House of the Undying, in which Rhaegar appears in an apparent flashback. Daenerys sees a man and a woman, presumably Rhaegar and Elia Martell, Rhaegar's first wife. The young woman is holding a baby, presumably Aegon, Rhaegar's firstborn son, and the woman asks Rhaegar if he will write a song for him. Rhaegar tells the woman that he already has a song, and that his is the Song of Ice and Fire. Now at first glance, this appears to be a vision of the past. Rhaegar and Elia are welcoming their newborn baby into the world, with Rhaegar deeming him the prince that was promised. Let's look at this vision from a different perspective. Let's say that this vision of Rhaegar isn't necessarily in the past, but a glimpse into the future that never was. We know from Daenerys' visions of her dead son that visions in Game of Thrones can contain events that never happened, essentially an alternate time. Timeline. What's interesting about this vision is that there is no physical description of the woman, only of the man, which is clearly Rhaegar. This is why I think the woman seen by Daenerys is not Elia Martell, but Lyanna Stark. Rhaegar says the baby will be named Aegon. What better name for a king? Thanks to Bran Stark in the season 7 finale, we now know that Jon's real name is not Jon, but Aegon, and he is the true heir to the Iron Throne essentially a king. It would also make more sense as to why Rhaegar says the baby's song is the song of ice and fire. His mother is ice, and his father is fire. Rhaegar then locks eyes with Daenerys and says there must be another. The dragon must have three heads. This could be in reference to Daenerys' impending birth and her ability to bring back dragons to the world. Being that Jon is approximately nine months older than Daenerys, this statement would make sense continuity-wise. Rhaegar then begins to play the harp and a sweet sadness fills the room. Notice how the man, woman, and baby all fade away, but the song lingers on, suggesting that while we all eventually die, music lives forever. This is why Rhaegar hid the prophecy within a song. Scrolls and old texts can be destroyed and damaged, but songs can live forever. They are passed down from generation to generation, immortalizing their heroes and celebrating their triumphs. Also notice the lack of names for these two songs. Jenny's song is not an official name, that's what it's called by the Ghost of High Heart. And the Song of Ice and Fire is also not said by Rhaegar as an official name, it's just a metaphor. Every song mentioned in the show or novels has been given an official name by the author, whether it be the Dornishman's Wife, the Reigns of Castamere, Gentle Mother, Font of Mercy. Jenny's song and the Song of Ice and Fire are the only two songs mentioned within the novels that aren't given an official name by the author. Coincidence? Fuck no. So when Rhaegar tells Lyanna that their son already has a song, the Song of Ice and Fire, he is referring to Jenny's song, a song filled with sweet sadness that brings women to tears and talks about forgotten kings and Targaryen tragedies, the song that conceals and protects the Woods Witch's prophecy. We may never know the full lyrics to the prophecy of the prince that was promised, but we can assume its meaning. In essence, Game of Thrones is an anti-war story. For several years, the great families of Westeros have fought amongst themselves, destroying their country, all while ignoring an apocalyptic threat up north. Meanwhile, dragons have returned to the world, and they too have the power for absolute destruction. This is why the prince that was promised must not have only been born to the Targaryen line, 
but to the Stark line as well. He must have the blood of Old Valeria and the blood of the First Men in order to stop this deadly conflict before it begins. Rhaegar Targaryen learned the full prophecy from the Woods Witch at Summerhall, and he hid the prophecy where it would always be safe, where it could be heard by anyone yet never be destroyed. Rhaegar hid the prophecy within a song, the Song of Ice and Fire. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. If you like this video, give it a like, give it a share, give it a comment, give it your heart and soul, you know, do all that good stuff. And I would like to thank, from the bottom of my heart, even though I don't have a heart, our Patreon supporters, these guys, you guys are incredible for all you do to help us grow this channel, to improve the channel, um, and you can check out our Patreon page, at patreon nerdsoup if you visit the Patreon page, you can see the different rewards that we offer to our patrons. We just had t-shirts made, we have mugs, stickers, we have all the good stuff, all the Nerd Soup merch. And if you want to donate, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. I'm glad that you're here commenting, discussing Game of Thrones. It's what we love to do. And once again, I would like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. We at Nerd Soup recently created our own official website using Squarespace, and our site will have articles and blog posts that go along with our YouTube videos. So make sure to check that out. Squarespace is a personal preference of mine because it's just so easy to use. They have a wide variety of beautifully designed templates, so whether if you're a musician, a small business owner, a movie critic, somebody who wants to write their own theories, Squarespace is the perfect all-in-one platform for designing your personal website. And I can't stress this enough, it is so easy to use. You don't need any prior knowledge of coding or web design. Squarespace does all that for you. They have 24-7, 365 support. They're like me, they don't take days off. And if you use the link, squarespace.com nerdsoup, you'll get 10% off your first purchase. You can find that link in the description below. There's just one note that I wanted to make about the video concerning the different canons between the book and the show. In the book, there's actually a character, King Jaharis II, who came after Aegon V in the line of succession. For some reason, the show removed him from the canon and made Aegon V the grandfather of Rhaegar and Daenerys and Viserys, but in the book, it's Jaharis who's their grandfather. So, just wanted to point that out. I don't know why the show removed it, but it doesn't change the fact that Jon is probably the prince that was promised. So, just a quick note. Our next Game of Thrones video is going to be about the anti-war themes found in Game of Thrones. So this theory video, I kind of see it as a spiritual successor to our previous one, What Do the White Walkers Want? And this next video is going to basically tie these videos together. Um, so be on the lookout for that. That should be dropping later this month. And once again, thanks for watching. Happy belated Halloween.